one of the prize areas, you know, like you guys out in Oregon have some of the best, like most talented growers, some of the best land out there, you know. Welcome to Oregon Rooted. I'm Higher Peaks. And this is Lady Sativa. You're listening to The Dirt Show. Where we bring you Oregon's cannabis culture. Welcome to the Dirt Show. I'm Higher Peaks, and this is Lady Sativa. Okay, this is how we're going to get into it. <laughs> Let's just drop the bomb now. Let's do it. Coronavirus. I really try to avoid Bring talking, it, bitch. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to try to talk, avoid talking about it because that's all everybody's talking about, and mm -hmm. I understand that. I'm just going to say this: as far as how it affects us, you know, I, we're we're doing our thing, mm -hmm. being inside. I'm inside mostly anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, washing hands, doing all the stuff that everybody's doing, you know, we're still enjoying things mm -hmm. other than the fact you can't get anything on the shelf anymore. So I guess it's just ordering from Amazon. Because no, you can't find, you can't okay. find okay. hand sanitizer on there unless it's <laughs> apparently overseas. Yeah. I don't know, but I doubt it'll get here. But yeah, hand sanitizer and ass wipes are the thing that we need in the future guys when, you know, the end of the world happens. No tizer and as JB puts it and no wipes, uh, even baby wipes like shit. We're screwed there and we got washcloths. I ain't scared. No, I know, but it's just, you know, convenient. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. We uh, could rewash the wipes. I think we bought the last one of the last what gallons of 99%. No, um, they have a few boxes left. Well, shit. I'm not going to tell you where it's at. Don't. <laughs> I'm not going to say shit. So we can still make our and own Kaiser. Right. And then they, they could only order five more gallons. Like they put in another order and they could only order five more gallons. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's all they could get their hands on from distributors. Well, I understand. That's that's what I'm saying. Like, I will we'll try to buy the rest of them. Right. Just but not tell I, them. I, I do got to say, uh, Talent Health Club, we are keeping clean. We're spraying everything down. Good staying on top of it not closing anything down yeah i hope not all of us got to make money too we all have families that's the thing is i feel really bad for how this is going to hit everybody and i see i don't want to go into this too much but you know i my um my empathy goes out to everybody that's going to be affected yeah. it's scary that is the scary part i'm not so much you I'm know not I'm, a, I'm not afraid of the sickness no i'm, I'm afraid of what's happening yeah. around us yeah so because of this panic in terms of yeah exactly so in terms of how it affects us on the podcast i don't think it'll really affect us what's going to happen is people are probably going to stop coming in so listeners you know we apologize you're going to have to probably listen to more uh remote interviews which mm -hmm. i know i've been slapping a couple out lately but uh i think most likely people interviews will want to be remote yeah. at this point but i'll do my best to keep that sound quality up and so I, like i said i i hope i hope it doesn't affect anything what really is going to hurt is right now we really start getting out of the farms again mm -hmm. and so i think that's going to be held back yeah which is probably. okay it's still early in the season it's understandable yeah and it, right now things are just like especially outdoors they are just starting to go into the ground just starting to look good yeah not even going to the ground yet no so again just popping i should say <laughs> right for the listeners just be patient while we get through you know Tread this time these waters of the remotes i think is what's going to happen so be prepared uh next i just want to thank two two countries one is australia i mean god like a few months ago I started seeing, you know, this little uptick of Australia. I'm like, hey, hi guys, how you doing? Mm -hmm. And then uh, lately, it's just been getting bigger and bigger. So I don't know you if guys someone's have been out tacking. there. Yeah, I don't know if you've been spreading the word. If you have, thank you so damn much. You're spreading it around like wildfire. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Spreading around like the coronavirus. Oh, like wildfires and coronavirus. <laughs> uh, but we appreciate you. So shout out to you. You guys are our number one country right now for downloads. Huh? hell yeah so let us hear from you if you guys have something to say or you want us to do, do, maybe do some episode 
that would Benefit yeah, Australia you wants to hear, let us know. Organrooted at gmail.com. I think it would be fun, by the way, to do an ask us everything or anything. What? With, for listeners? Like, yeah. They can write in emails or whatever and ask us whatever they want. Well, I will mention this. So we do have some emails that we've been sitting on. I've been sitting on. Um, there's several areas where people get a hold of us at. And one of them is through our contact us on our website. And those tend to not get seen as soon only mm -hmm. because, and everybody's like, what, that's to contact you. You're supposed to, well, uh, the, the way our, the website works is it's like, it's kind of in a bad spot where those messages chill. And so I don't see it. My bad. I'm, I'm on it now though, but I have a lot of emails that are really good and I want to share them for one, but two, a few of them we're going to make into episodes. Hell yeah. So we're going to take a really good subject that's been recommended and make it into a full blown episode for that person. And I think it'll benefit a lot of people. So yeah, that'll that's, be fun. that's what's going to happen with that. So for people that have contacted us and emailed us, and if you have not heard back from me yet, this you, is why you No, know, well, you will hear back from me. And then some of you will hear back about making a full episode. Yeah. Okay. So now next is Canada. They were second. I just want to shout out to them because they're our second biggest country right now. And you know, hell Canada. Yeah. Canada. Canada. Okay. <laughs> So they're real close. Although you guys won't let me in because of my DUI. So I can't come yeah, see I you guys. <laughs> I can't come see you. We can wave from afar. I got turned around at the border a Along while. With your dad and <laughs> yeah. mother-in-law up there. Hey. Yeah. So yeah, my dad and, and stepmom, you know, chill up there uh, for part of the year. But uh, so going, you know, I tried to go up there and yeah, I got turned around um, and got and, busted. Oh, it was a long trip up. And just to get turned around, I was pissed. <laughs> we like it. Not that much. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Um, yeah. The, between a DUI and they said I didn't have enough money. So damn it. <laughs> oh, you a broke bitch. That's what broke. they said. <laughs> I was young and broke. <laughs> I was going to come rustle up Canada. But thank you guys. I appreciate it. So let's get into this, to the news. Uh, real quick, the House of Veterans Affair Committee, they are now uh, they expanding. Bill. They passed bills. They're expanding research on therapeutic benefits of marijuana, which includes doctors being able to. They per get to prescribe it, basically. Yeah, they can issue medical cannabis recommendations. Mm -hmm. It's about fucking time. That's awesome. And I hope that's really true. So I hope this actually trickles I hope down it, and it I hope works. it sticks with it and it yep. keeps going forward from there because there's a lot of people that can't do both. Exactly. The Alabama Senate approved a bill to legalize medical cannabis. So now Alabama is aboard. Hell yeah. Thank you guys. It's about time you come. Southern states were hard, mm -hmm. are hard yeah. to get this stuff going. So. Right. <laughs> and then just real quick, I want to mention the campaign to decriminalize psychedelics in Washington, D.C. This is part of decrim nature, decriminalized nature. Mm hmm. This stems from them working up in, in D.C., over in D.C. Uh, all this says is that basically they are waiting or got approval to wait or postpone be getting signatures. They're doing well there, but because, because of, of this coronavirus. Because so, of the everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but it looks like they got approval. So, but they're doing well. And that's what I really want to make note of is so Washington, D.C., Maybe they will come along with us on this mm -hmm. journey of psych movement, psych, uh, psychoactive culture. The Arizona House of Representatives approved a bill to allow children with autism to access medical cannabis. A lot of people. That's important. Um, I would hope that all states would do this or have this, but good job, Arizona. Oregon does it. Though. Probably. I don't know. To be specific, I yeah. don't know. But I know there's a lot of people, including Jinx, Jinx proof, you know, his genetics, yeah. he's well known. His son's got autism and it's treated, I believe by that. So, well, I do know actually, um, tough shed, Mike, his okay. son has been, has been dosed with CBD since he was oh, young good. Okay, yeah, because he has some, like pretty severe autism. Right. And okay. so he, he used it for that as well. So I, Oregon must, must I, allow I, they it. must allow it because I think that's a couple people that we would know that do. And he, we do, do know that Jinx proof, proof is from. Uh, Oregon. Well, and I believe we've even seen and mentioned studies about, you know, autism being one of mm -hmm. those things they've kind of not necessarily hard proven fact, but, but have seen evidence that it clearly works. Yes. The Oregon medical marijuana program. This is really cool. 
the advisory committee is sitting down to discuss new rules on testing. And we've been talking about this for months. Mm -hmm. Jason Wilson from Curious About Cannabis talked about it with me. One big thing is they don't test for mycotoxins in cannabis here. Right. And I'll tell you, uh, we've talked about it, about the golden mold. Even we talked about it today where they're with no testing, they can blast this moldy cannabis mm -hmm. and uh, say BHO. And, and there's no, if there is mycotoxins in there, we don't know. Yeah. We won't know. And they can get away with it all day long, mm -hmm. which is very scary. Yeah. And it's a very bad thing. Once it builds up in your system, it causes some severe problems for long periods of time. It's a lot like uh what do they call that with tick? Is that Lyme disease or something? Yeah. Yeah. Once you have it, it's like very difficult to, to work with and get rid of. Anyway. Yeah. So they're going to look at testing that and heavy metals, which boom, that's another thing. Hell yeah. Uh, that's big. Cannabis plants along with mushrooms, uh, obviously will suck up that stuff. Mm -hmm. So something we need to know. Yeah. And that's good. So hopefully not only do they discuss it, but actually apply it. And yeah. OHA covers that and OHA decides the rules. And I guess OLCC then enforces it is how it works. Yeah. So it's covered. That's the Oregon Health Authority. Yeah. Mexican marijuana legalization legislation did not advance the Senate floor this week, as was anticipated last week. I wonder why. Uh... <laughs> That is a mouthful, by the way. Mexican marijuana legalization legislation. <laughs> I don't think, I think there's a lot of people with guns down there that won't want that to happen. <laughs> I think the Senate doesn't want to fuck around with the wrong people. <laughs> that would shut a lot of shit down, I think. I think, at least for marijuana, but. I can't say positively. <laughs> All I know is there's probably some coercion going on there somewhere. <laughs> there might be, and I don't think money is involved. <laughs> right, exactly. There's no buying off. There may be, though. Hey. There might be. You never know. Because you might want to keep them in your pocket. My dad uh, bought, out of, bought himself out of a ticket with, I think, a pair of Nikes one time down there. So. <laughs> Oh, man. A study found that the use of Sativex could improve the quality of life of patients with a reasonable incremental cost, resulting as a cost-effective option for patients with multiple sclerosis resistant spasticity. Well, that sounds cool because I haven't heard of anything that the Sativex is good for, That because it's just the pill that I've, I haven't heard much about it. I have not either. And I have had, you know, taking care of people that take medication. But Have you ever heard of anybody taking Sativex? No, I don't know how new Sativex is. I'm hoping I'm not raping is, that word. Uh, me too. Sativex. Sativex? No, nah, I don't <laughs> no, think No, so. I don't think that's it. it <laughs> I think it's Sativex. Um, Sativex? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but either way, no, even when I was taking care of somebody with MS, um, I couldn't tell you if they were taking that or not. I think it might be a newer drug. Another thing, though, is MS is shown, having cannabis shown to be effective treatment for MS. We've, we've talked about it. It has, yes, yeah. for sure. So again, excellent. And I'm glad to see that working, uh, whether or not it's the pill. The pill. Yeah, see, I think so. Sativex is definitely a newer thing. Cause... Yeah, but it's been around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's not like the old Marinol, though, I think is what a lot of people Yeah, remember. I think that's what, yeah. Mm -hmm. A study of rats found that a single administration of psilocybin or LSD produced persistent antidepressant-like effects, but that, in contrast, ketamine produced only a transient antidepressant-like effect. <laughs> I am really glad that we're see seeing this even in rats. I mm -hmm. wonder how they measure the depression. Like, do they sit how down? How depressed is this rat? How are you feeling today? I mean... <laughs> How do you they feel that your mom just got killed yesterday? <laughs> How would they know if they're depressed? It must be behavior. It must be. Displayed behavior. Won't pick its head up. <laughs> he looks kind of like Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So uh, that's, that's really it. Uh, I could mention the USA Weightlifting announced a partnership with a CBD company. That's one good step. Pure spectrum. Yeah. Hopefully it's not full spectrum isolate no but i think i've seen pure <laughs> spectrum before have you yeah all right so we have joe kigro from kigro solutions now here's the history on that he was on episode 51 and we talked about kind of where he came from 
uh, Nevada is home base, I believe. And, uh, he's got a product key grow product solutions, uh, got some cool packaging on it, but nonetheless, it's a really good product and it hits a lot of things. It's, you know, it's got a good price point and it's, it's a good product somewhere in between organic and synthetic. Uh, we used his stuff last year and we talked about it, but we used it on our ornamentals and our vegetables. Is this the same interview that I came in and he was on the computer? Could have been. In his hotel room? <laughs> Could have been. Okay. I probably I edited so. that Cause out. Cause you guys were down here and I remember, I think. Oh I was, yeah. Yeah. And then that I was came it. down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I there was a lot so. of editing on that. On that. Uh, yeah. I think interview. I walked in like halfway through. I'm like, Oh, Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but real smart guy. Now we've been using it on our ornamentals and tummy toes and tomatoes or vegetables and with real good success. Mm -hmm. uh, tomatoes I mean, looked amazing, it, amazing. They tasted great. They, mm -hmm. they performed well. Uh, so did the flowers and I could go on and on and on with all the good things that, that it was, was bottom line is I did a little tiny bit of testing on some seedlings and it was great. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that now we're going to transition this year and try it on a run of cannabis. Right. Uh, now I've always told people that I'm a hybrid grower, so I like to have a foundation of organics and then I like to do things like correct with, uh, uh, you know, um, some sort of conventional line. Mm -hmm. Like I don't mind conventional cow mags sometimes, or like say, like I use silica and mm -hmm. I mean right there, no matter what I did, that throws me out of the totally organic, you know, uh, realm. So but I, I use silica and, and people know we, you know, we use silica, we use mammoth P and we use the SLF 100, Yeah. which by the way, on the mammoth, we're going to try the bio control this year. Nice. So look out for the review on that. Um, so we're mostly organic, um, I minus a couple by of things. SLF. I love SLF. It does I everything. Have a pussy willow growing in the window right there with some massive ass roots on it. Thanks to that SLF 100. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it works great. Well, we put a drop. It, man, it almost looks like there's too. another tree growing out of the end of it. I don't know if you've looked at it, but it's starting to grow bark. The I swear roots to God. <laughs> quickly growing. It's, it's amazing. So, and then this year we're going to, as far as organics though, this year we've been, we've been doing a lot of liquid organics over the years. Mm -hmm. And as much as I like them, I really want to uh, up my game. I, I think I'm ready to up my game into strictly, uh, 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 top, top dressing, top dressing, yeah. uh, amending and top dressing. And then also doing some good solid teas with some top dressings of compost. And I like to use that Oregon seacoast compost. Yeah. It's a biodynamic product. It's gotten locally off our beaches. Awesome. And we can buy it uh, right up the road. Yeah. Awesome. Amazing products. Such high quality. If you're in Oregon, look for that Oregon Seacoast compost and you get that through um, down to earth distributors. It's just a damn good product. Anyway, so top. where to get it around here. Well, if you're, if you're around here, go over to Applegate Soils. They there got you it. Go. Yeah. And that's where we get it. Shout out to Applegate Soils. To Roach. To Roach. <laughs> uh, they got it there at Affordable too. So, but. Uh, Top dressing, compost, and teas. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to try a run on that key grow, mm -hmm. uh, along with what we mentioned. So, again, it's hybrid, but, uh, you know, as much success as I saw on those plants, I really want to see what it's like for for cannabis. And that's what we do. That's mm -hmm. what the show is about, is trying things and letting people know about them. Yeah. With that said, there's some technology that we briefly covered in 51 but he really covers and explains it so people understand it in this episode. Oh, he gets down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. And what that is, is uh, organic potassium salts, which he goes into. And this polyamine tech, polyamine technology. And the polyamine technology is really freaking cool. So it, seriously, it's a good interview. And listen, listen to what that shit is. I, I can't repeat it even to my, you know, I couldn't repeat it now. <laughs> I know it, but I can't repeat it. And he does real well. It was fun hearing you say polyamine over and over again. Polyamine. Polyamine. Poly oh, okay. Did it sound like polyamine? Great. Edit. No. It just, maybe that's what I heard. <laughs> so, uh, the one thing is, is we're, you know, Oregon rooted. Uh, the problem is, is this product is not cleared for Oregon yet. Although there's nothing in it that would not, um, you know, it would not trigger any kind of testing or anything like that. Uh, it's just not readily available. Mm -hmm. So he does tell people how to get a hold of it if you would like to try it. And as well, if you get a hold of him, I'm sure he'll send you samples. Mm -hmm. 
and it's definitely worth giving you a try. Now, right now it's geared for commercial because of the, the, the way this works, the stuff is simple and it's effective and affordable. So, uh, you know, it's, it, their base right now is commercial activity. Mm -hmm. Although if you go to his IG, you'll see that's, um, Joel Kikro. Uh, I'll get the IG, but if you go to his IG, Kikro solutions. Yeah. If you go to his IG, you'll see that, uh, there's a lot of these small growers, closet growers, even, um, and you know, I'm going to add some info into this on an outside grow. So, uh, there's a lot of people getting involved on the lower levels. Right. Um, and this stuff works great. So here it is, Joel Kegro, uh, Oregon Love. Oregon Love. Stay rooted. Stay rooted. So the polyamine tech existed prior to this. Like the polyamine tech and the potassium acetate were both being used, you know, widely in agriculture. Um, obviously, through our parent company. Um, so the idea of including those in the line, I mean, it, it pretty much the line was almost founded around the idea of making those materials available for cannabis, if you will. You know, we've also had great success in kind of like super soil or living soil systems where, uh, you know, there's a combination of slow release nutrients and these fast release nutrients, plus like our limited spectrum of bacteria going in, you know, helps to continue propagate their living soil. Um, and we've had explosive root growth and production that way as well. Um, so I have found, uh, you know, at least I feel that these materials are very forgiving. Um, they work well with, with most products, um, you know, especially the, uh, you know, the polyamine technology like we were talking about, the potassium acetate technology. I feel like those individual things also make every other line work more efficiently uh, uh, if they're combined in with that. Uh, and that sort of goes back to, uh, and we haven't talked about this yet. Uh, the last time I was here, I think we strictly talked about the, uh, the four part uh, feeding schedule, which is, um, you know, it's a white Royal, red Royal, blue butterfly and purple cat. Yes. Um, and those are, you know, pretty much everything you need uh, from even, you know, we have a clone rooting formula that we've been using uh, out of those products all the way up till, you know, flush and harvest. But wow. we, uh, we have two other products that we're in the registration process on. Uh, and those are called Silver Rabbit and Green Dragon. And, um, you know, I've been getting asked about these a lot. Uh, I feel like for something that isn't on the market, uh, there's a good amount of hype behind them. Like I get asked multiple times every day by people uh, where they can go buy them already. And we haven't even, you know, really been advertising it. We've only done like a few teasers on social media or something where right. I posted like the bottles with the artwork or something. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that, but those are, you know, two side standalone amendments, if you will, um, that we sort of produced with the intention of allowing people to include the benefits of our technology without having to completely change everything that they're doing. Um, I feel like the four part feeding uh, process is very simple, uh, but you know, it's a lot easier to, um, you know, say to somebody, for example, you know, maybe try adding in a little bit of this green dragon uh, and see how your plants react rather than, you know, maybe try changing everything that you're doing and see what happens. Right. You know? Right. Um, which is a big angle to it for sure. But there's so many other applications um, for those particular products, sort of a standalone, if you will. Uh, and living soil, for example, is, is one of those big um, examples that I could think of. So, um, you know, the, the silver rabbit uh, is a uh, polyamine orthophosphate product. Uh, and that will make pretty much all materials more efficient and kind of open the pH range availability probably for any line uh, that it comes into contact with, at least within, um, you know, some limit. Uh, that one, is, you know, has a little bit of nitrogen. It's got a little bit of potassium acetate in it, but it's essentially a polyamine orthophosphate booster, um, which is 
exciting. It's also um, possibly the only really efficient version of a phosphorus that's available through foliar spray that I can think of as well. Interesting. Uh, which is pretty big implications, in my opinion, for a living soil grower. Um, the one downside, perhaps, to that to some people is that the, the nitrogen sources that are in there are not organic, um, but they are incredibly clean. Definitely no uh, ethical issues with uh, the collection there for me personally, which is a whole other topic for another day, perhaps. Yes. Um, but... Um, yeah, outside of that, the rest of it is all, you know, organic chemistry. Um, you know, we don't bother to certify any of it because certification and definition, not the same thing. But, I mean, you know, if you look at the green dragon, the potassium acetate, you know, we actually, uh, we have a patent uh, that is on organic potassium salt fertilizers. Uh, so, I mean, that'll tell you right there that our, you know, our, our method of producing the potassium acetate uh, is definitely not with an inorganic acid base. Um, you know, it's right there in the patent, whether it's, it's certified or not. So you're not going to be able to like get your certification using it. Cause like, whatever. Um, sorry if that's, you know, what you're, what you're going for. I get it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the green dragon though, that is a, uh, it's a 19%, uh, potassium, and uh, I believe off the top of my head, 6% sulfur product. It's basically what you would consider by those numbers to be a terpene enhancer. Okay. Although, you know, by the nature of the potassium acetate, I consider it a little bit more of an essential oil enhancer in general, but it's also a carbohydrate booster. Uh, see, the, uh, the potassium acetate component, uh, you know, it's made with a, what's called an acetic acid uh, and to... Uh, in layman's terms, acetic acid, you could sort of think of it as like a highly concentrated vinegar. Like, because vinegar is like a 5 to 10% maybe acetic acid and 90 to 95% water. Um, not exactly the form you would want to put into a plant, but that kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, and what that does, well, in, internally in the plant, the plant is always looking for sources of an acetic acid. Inside the plant, it's referred to as a acetyl coenzyme A. Uh, and this particular molecule in the plant, it's, it's produced uh, through glycolysis from photosynthesis, which means uh, its production is, I mean, it's, a, it's limited to the plant's ability to intake light through its leaf surfaces. And then most of the nutrients that it takes in uh, provides the energy to produce these materials through photosynthesis, as well as giving the plant building blocks to, um, you know, produce the physical uh, materials you know, of the plant structure itself. Um, but the actual carbohydrate reserves, the actual glucose that the roots are produced out of, um, all of the cannabinoid synthesis pathways are activated by, uh, and at least one out of the two known terpene synthesis pathways are all activated by this single molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. And the plant has to go through great lengths uh, in order to, to produce that internally. And it has what's called a uh, sink source relationship within the plant, where the plant is constantly taking a look at how, uh, ha like how much of this material is within it, uh, how much like reserves of glucose it has inside of itself to sort of determine uh, rationing out these materials. So whatever stage it's going to go into next, like say you're about to uh, go into transition and you, you've just flipped it into a 12-12 light schedule, uh, your plant is now, it's doing math. It's looking at like, okay, well, I've got this much acetyl coenzyme A in me. I've got this much carbohydrates stored up inside of me. Um, you know, I have this much phosphorus reserves, et cetera, et cetera this is how much effort I'm going to put into this next phase. So the more of those materials like you have inside of the plant uh, during that phase, the more effort is going to put into producing more nodes and bud sites, um, you know, just all around, uh, you know, everything that pretty much you want the plant to produce. I mean, it's, 
and it has to take inventory on this. So we're giving it a constant source of this material directly, um, which also, uh, as a side note, is a complete microbe superfood. So like this Green Dragon product is um, very, very useful to a living soil grower, in my opinion. Uh, si similar to the, uh, you know, the silver rabbit being a fully available phosphorus as well. The uh, the green dragon is, um, well, it, it's also the most fully available form of potassium known in in current science as well. Um, the uh, the second would be off the top of my head, like potassium citrate, and it's like five times more available through foliar spray than that. So. Um, definitely multifunctional, you know. What's the other product? Well, the other one's the silver rabbit. So silver that, rabbit. That was okay. the, uh, yeah, the polyamine orthophosphate booster. So they're also very, very highly concentrated. Um, you know, the, the silver rabbit, uh, I think is off the top of my head is like 31% nutrient, uh, in that liquid. Wow. So it's like, it's like 7% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, and 4% uh, potassium acetate. And then the green dragon is, I mean, that's 19 and six. So that one's like 25% nutrient there as well. Um, so it's going to be a pretty big value play, uh, compared to like products, uh, already, uh, you know, outside of the increased performance, but uh, literally like those two things are going to make uh, any nutrient program that they're combined with more efficient. Right. Um, so to kind of go back to um, defining the polyamine a little bit more. Yeah. So this one is a conversation that you're definitely not going to hear anywhere else. Um, so imagine, I, so I, I like to use the phosphorus as an example. Because phosphorus is like probably the hardest nutrient to work with out of all. In my opinion, probably, I mean, it's definitely one of the most important. Right. And I think it's, I don't want to be, you know, scientifically held to this per se, but I think that phosphorus is generally misunderstood um, in its use in cannabis. And I have, you know, theories about why it's used when it is, but, but really um, I believe that phosphorus is, it should be getting in very early in the plant's life cycle. If you look at, you know, the majority of, of a large agriculture out there, uh, everything, all seeds are, are started with phosphorus. You know, phosphorus is one of the materials like inside of the seed that the plant uses to start. You know, it's, it's very, very important, like for the plant to have a strong uh, beginning in order to, to develop a lot of cells. Um, you know, it's, it's the building block that the DNA and the RNA are made out of. Uh, and I think, you know, a, a nitrogen heavy approach up front will give the plant, um, feed. Obviously it'll stretch it out. It'll develop chlorophyll. It'll grow. But I think that can lead to a lot more weakness later down the line when it doesn't have as much of the, um, you know, the, the phosphorus, like more cells, like within the plant structure itself. I think you kind of are, are ending up with a lot, uh, larger, more stretched out plant cells that have maybe thinner walls. Sure. Um, but a lot of phosphorus is very, very difficult to work with. And if you were trying to use that as like your initial starter feed with most of them, your plant really wouldn't be getting anything in the first few weeks. Um, at least not in the level that a, you know, a first few week vegetative plant, which is just exploding with growth requires. So, um, you know, if you look at the phosphorus, like it's perfect pH range for absorption, you know, is in like the, something like the six, six to like 6.9 range, which is a range that you would never, ever, ever pH like for your cannabis, like even in right. soil, <sighs> I can only imagine it would lead up to a lot of other problems. So phosphorus is only available if it's broken down into an ortho or like a single molecule. Otherwise um, it's completely immobile in the soil or medium. Uh, and you know, the plant is unable to absorb that. So you either have to um, rely on biology to break that polychain phosphorus back into orthomolecules to make it available for the plant. Uh, and 
you know, a lot of bacteria is not so great at breaking down phosphorus. Actually, you need pretty specific um, bacteria to do that. We have our version, you know, and there's, you know, like mammoth pea and stuff. That's a great, great product for that. Uh, but, you know, there's uh, limited spectrum versus full spectrum. It depends what you're, you're trying to do. That's a, a good conversation to have uh, sometime as well, probably. But uh, so the way that most phosphorus is broken down, like into an ortho state, into a single molecule is to produce a phosphoric acid. So um, the phosphoric acid version of it, that's essentially the only immediately available version of phosphorus for the plant. But that is generally done with a, a sulfuric acid base. Right. Uh, and in creating that single molecule version of phosphorus, uh, extracting it down, you're often left with a lot of toxins in it because um, the, the history of phosphorus, I mean, it's, it's basically ground up rock out of the ground. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a lot of cadmium in it. There's a lot of arsenic. Um, and, you know, some things that don't show up on tests. I mean, there's, you know, sometimes a fair amount of, say, uranium and stuff in it as well. Um, so it's generally not enough to really have an effect on your plant or to, say, show up in results or whatever. If you were using biology to break that stuff down, the biology would clean a lot of that out. But when you start extracting and purifying that stuff, um, you know, then you get also extracted and purified cadmium and arsenic. So, you know, if you use too much of that um, phosphoric acid on a young plant, I mean, it's, you know, the toxins in it are going to essentially eat it up. So, so you have a hard time kind of working with it. So um, like what our process is, our, our, we do use, you know, what's technically a, a phosphoric acid, but our extraction instead of being done with an inorganic acid base, like a sulfuric acid is, it's done with a, a blend of amino acids. And these amino acids are, um, you know, like anything in chemistry, you can find the right combination that are volatile together uh, and they create a combustion process. So as this combustion happens and the materials distill, um, the phosphoric molecules uh, chelate themselves inside of the amino acids. So in a way, um, the molecules are already locked up, but they are locked up inside of an amino acid that does not cause it to not be able to perform. Um, so now these amino acids, they also have points on them as a phosphorus molecule would that are able to connect to other molecules. So these amino acids can lock up to other amino acids. They can grab other molecules such as EDTAs, like for micronutrients, et cetera. Um, it, you know, it, they're also very, very clean, kind of to go back to the toxicity. Um, it, it is very effective at filtering out nearly all toxins. Um, the only thing in terms of like toxic metals that remains in our entire feeding schedule is a little bit of cadmium from the phosphorus extraction, which is very, very hard to, to remove all of it. But it's something like if you ran a heavy feeding schedule, um, by the end of it, you'd be looking at something like 0 0.017 parts per million or something to that effect, which um, by my math and calculations is some of the lowest numbers of, of toxicity that you'll find uh, in any product anywhere. Uh, but these, these also will uh, lock up with other molecules uh, in such a way that the actual phosphoric molecules are not attached to anything else. So um, they stay in their ortho state. They are available to the plant. But now, so imagine that you've now created like this polychain of different nutrient molecules, but they're all available to the plant. Now, all of these different types of nutrients are best available to the plant at different pH ranges, right? So whatever the pH range is, it's better suited for one of these nutrients. And now they're in a chain and it's pulling that nutrient in and it's helping to pull all of the other nutrients into it at that pH range while remaining in their ortho state inside of these amino acids. Um, and that's what we mean when we talk about the, uh, the polyamine test. 
Uh, so all of, uh, yeah, essentially all of our cations are, are treated in, in such a way. Uh, and it's definitely exclusive to us. Like you won't be able to find that conversation anywhere else. No. And it, that's the first time, I mean, you explained it really well. It's the first time I actually understood it. Can you do that with all nutrients? Well, at this point, it seems that we are, you know, essentially limited to the cations or the positively okay. charged molecules. I just wanted to let people know you have brought this up a couple of times with the pH and stuff, but I see this, the things that you talk about uh, as far as your nutrients, I see those same things last year when we used your product, we used it on our ornamentals and our vegetables and very forgiving. I mean, you can bump it up if you want to, and you can back it off if you want to. Yeah, no, but, but I mean, you hit the, the nail on the head though, too. Like forgiving is a term that we use a lot because, you know, it, it, as is the nature of anything, if you try hard enough, like you can still make mistakes like right. with this too. You know, I've had people who, um, you know, they forget where they are on their feeding schedule and they might accidentally hit it with a double dose that week. Um, but, you know, the plant, like if you just kind of, stay the course, like accommodate for what you did before and kind of just continue on, uh, things tend to correct themselves fairly quickly and easily. Um, so, uh, similarly, you know, I've seen, um, you know, people switch, um, I'm not going to mention any names of companies or whatever, but say you were using like another line, uh, and that line didn't quite perform the same way. And some of it built up into the medium, if you will. Uh, and then you switched over to this and this also has like the bacterial element and also the polyamine that has a habit of pulling more things in with it. Um, and I've seen, you know, people switch over, you know, mid grow and all of a sudden the bacteria starts, you know, using up the excess nutrients in the medium. And, um, you know, you, they've ended up with like a little bit of an uncharacteristic burn, like during that transitional stage while it's kind of switching over. Um, and it wasn't really the prettiest thing to look at, but I come back a couple of weeks later and it's completely correct, you know? So, you know, sometimes even when, when things look grim, uh, I think that you have a very good chance of being able to turn it around as long as you don't freak out and, and try to do too many things to it. Too many things and, and too much of anything, you know, you don't want to start doing extreme <laughs> yeah. things, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Uh, which it actually, this leads me to this question. I myself personally did not find that I had to flush anything. What's your opinion on that? Have you had feedback with your, with growers that you do have to run an occasional flush? I mean, is there any buildup? We've, we've never had any issues uh, with like requiring mid flower flushes or anything like that. Uh, I do like, I like to flush at the end, um, you know, especially in non soil mediums, you know, we give you a lot to like, hold up as reserves in the plant. And you know, I don't know if this is like a, a sciencey thing, like or bro science or whatever, but I do feel like that's a, a very good plumping up period during the last couple of weeks, right. like putting it into that, um, you know, survival mode to, to take whatever it has left and push it out into, uh, into its resinous oils and kind of fill those buds out. Um, you know, that, but there's also like, there's that big debate about, um, you know, flushing soil well like, there's there's a lot of debate what does that even mean can yeah, you like, yeah can you and well i mean if, you, you? if you're talking soil and literally soil i mean if you're 100 percent cocoa i mean i have growers that grow in cocoa 100 percent cocoa um under lights and they do get down to zero ppms by the end of the flush you know but you just can't do that with soil especially organics i mean you're never going to see that and there's always stuff breaking down in soil right I do know that some nutrients are mobile and some aren't. So, I mean, right. you know, there's going to be nutrients. You just can't flush out of the plant. Now the plant may be able to use them up, but you're not going to pull them out of the plant. No, or out of the soil. Like they're going to stay where they are. And yeah. nor is every nutrient in the plant mobile to another part of the plant. I believe nitrogen is, I could be wrong on this, but I, I believe nitrogen is mobile it, in yeah, the plant. I mean, it depends on the form. You know, you get different mobility rates from different forms of nitrogen. You know, whether it's cation or anion. Right. But like phosphorus, that's not mobile in a plant, is it? You know, it does store up reserves on it and it will use those reserves. Right. 
Um, but is that's not necessarily mobile in the plant, right? Like if this part of the plant needs it, this part isn't necessarily going to send it over. Whereas nitrogen is a little bit more mobile that way, isn't it? Yeah, I think you're right. If you look at other agricultural products, even stuff that's cons or combusted, like say tobacco, and you can go to the purest tobacco you want. It doesn't have to be a Marlboro processed tobacco. You can take a tobacco out of the ground or whatever, dry it and cure it and smoke it, and they don't flush it. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I feel like some nutrient lines, like some materials, they just they leave certain flavors. Like I can taste, yeah, I can taste certain nutrient lines. Yes, um, and I. You know, that's consistent across the board, whether it was grown in soil or cocoa or flushed or not. Agreed. Um, and with ours, you know, I've experimented both ways. I, I've run the nutrients all the way up till, you know, where I've fed it the day before I've harvested. Uh, and I haven't really noticed much of a change in the flavor um, or in the whiteness of the ash. Like it wasn't suddenly dirty. Um, you know, you're going to get what you get out of the materials that you're using, I guess, you know, and uh, a lot of like what is being done in the flush, I feel like people attribute that to using up like the excess phosphorus because you, you know, you quote unquote, you don't want phosphorus like leftover inside of the nugs, like is kind of how I've had it explained. Uh, but the phosphorus isn't really stored in the buds, like phosphorus is stored within the leaves. Uh, you know, if it's excess from my understanding, uh, and what actually the, the material that like is inside of the bud, uh, is called a, like a diphosphate, right? but it's not like the same kind, like it's an in-between material that's like in between the acetyl coenzyme A and in between CBGA or terpene. So like these phosphate molecules are produced by the plant itself. They share a similar name. Uh, and I think maybe that's where some of the confusion comes from. If you did have, you know, excess of these like diphosphates left within um, the nug, then like, yeah, sure. You would have unconverted material, like perhaps lost potential in your resinous oil production. But if you're using a material um, you know, like the acetic acid, like the potassium acetate that we have, um, then I, I imagine that that would be a non-issue because it's got, you know, so much that it's pushing out its full production. Um, so it, it would seem anyway. I mean, one of the really insane things that we have had very consistently um that's sort of almost hard to talk about with people sometimes because it's just so ridiculous sounding, even to me saying it, even though I've seen it over and over and over for like the last year and a half or whatever it's been, is that almost every single grow that we touch, the plants, they harvest on average, at least a week faster than running other nutrient lines. And it's not done in a way where the plant is just like, oh, we're going to, you know, fog up the trichomes and just finish faster and not at full production. It's literally because it had so much of like what it needs to meet its metabolic processes. You know, it's not relying on getting everything from the light. So the plant just has everything. And it's just like, it has nowhere to go, but to like, but to, do its job faster. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. like you get like literally on the THC heavy strains, like we're seeing like the full almost 40% like in the production um, on the test results. And, you know, we've seen this on, on coal is that we're thicker than Arizona camp, you know? So like they are getting their whole yield. They are getting, like all the test results, like off of it, you know, whatever the plant is genetically inclined to, to want to produce, um, which is up to the plant. I mean, I'm sorry, I can't genetics. Yeah. Can't take your Jack Herrera and turn it into a 34% THC plant, but right. <laughs> too bad. <laughs> it doesn't do that. I'm sorry. Uh, it's up to the plant to decide, but yeah. Uh, but what you're saying is you, it maximizes it for sure. It, it, yeah. It yeah, lets like it get to its potential. Full on hitting, yeah, full on hitting maturity and finishing 
a week faster. It's literally because the plant is doing everything that it's capable to do within um, the confines of what you get it. Yeah, I mean, no hindrance. Yeah, I mean, there's all those other external factors. There's the genetic inclinations. There's, you know, what lights are using? What's the temperature? What is that plant like for environment, you know? Um, but this could be huge, though, for people if this is if this is really something that people see on average because, say, it's a big farm even. You know, that extra week is huge. There's, there's, some, there's, there's actually a downside to it, which is um, having to – you know, get used to figuring out like, when am I going to start my flesh now? And when am I going to plant my harvest? Uh, because that does change a little bit relative to what you're used to. Um, <laughs> I've, I've got bigger yeah. worries. Here's the deal. Like yeah. just, just for me right now, for you to say that I might be able to finish a week or so sooner is huge because now in our Valley, we have, we Jackson County is the largest, uh, the, that has the most hemp, cannabis, THC, all of it, growers in the state. Now, Oregon's already a big state for this stuff, but Jackson County is the most densest. During this season that's just now starting, uh, there's two or three months where the whole valley just smells like weed. You come down here. I'm not joking. I am not joking. You come down well, here. I'm down there for that. <laughs> oh, you come down here like at the end of August, so September, definitely October, part of November, this whole valley just smells like fresh weed now to the point that people do complain i mean we get a lot of we got we got freaking fields butted up against schools okay <laughs> so you know we do get our fair share of complaints because it does just and i i don't like to use this word stink but it's that potent where it's just potently smells um in the valley and so what I'm trying to get to long story, trying to make it short is that now that we have this big, huge monocropping going on, we have some serious problems every year. Now, one of them is pathogens, fungus issues. I got rust. Oh, yeah. I got rust fungus last year. I've never seen rust on cannabis ever. Uh, you know, things like aphids. Now this hemp aphid huge in the Valley. And so what happens though, is, you know, those aphids hit at the very end. So if you can harvest sooner, you're going to have less bug problems, less pathogen issues. You're not going to have to push necessarily that extra week, which might be rainy. I mean, there's a lot of advantages of that extra week. The plants that I was able to harvest early didn't get hit that hard. The plants that I had to take the extra two weeks got hit. They got slammed. So Yeah, you know, our, our first ever kind of real tests were done outdoors in California. And the difference in harvest time was so so ridiculous that I don't even feel comfortable saying how many weeks difference it was outdoors in California. Wow. But I'll put it this way. Like we took, we took a clone off of a plant like in July. We took a clone off of a plant in July, which as you know, is very, very late into the season. Yeah. I mean like this is like weeks before um, essentially well, I guess, that, I mean, you still got over a month, so we're probably looking at like six to maybe up to eight weeks of, uh, of veg time compared to the other plant, which started in what, May, probably May. Okay. So the clone um, was the key grow plant and the mom was uh, our control plant. Oh, okay. The clone uh, got bigger than the mom. Uh, produced more than the mom. Shit. Uh, and it finished before the mom. Wow. Um, by, wow. I'll just say by over a month. Wow. And it had to root too. So those, yeah. you know, seven days of rooting. Yes. Wow. So, um, again, I don't want to tell anyone that's typical, no. right. but like the numbers were like so ridiculous. I mean, it, it took me like, a year of this sort of thing happening before I would actually start talking about sure, it. Sure. Sure. Because I don't know. It's just like, it, it just doesn't seem realistic. I feel like if, if, especially in the early stages when not many people had tried this for me to go out there and, and be like, Oh yeah, this will make you, your plants finish faster. Like I think I just felt like a snake oil guy. Sure. <laughs> well, I had seen it for like a year and it was like, okay, we just, we have to 
tell people about this because they need to know ahead of time. <laughs> so they're not shocked, you know? Well, like planning, yeah. what, you know, a flushing and your nutrient schedule and whatever, whatever things you plan along the way, you got to reschedule that stuff. Uh, yeah, the, the first ever plant that we treated indoors, you know, my friend, he missed his harvest. Like he missed it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> He just, you know, he wasn't expecting that. And yeah, he came out one week and he was just like, oh man. <laughs> yeah, totally not what you're going for. Um, but no, I mean, it has huge implications. Like there, like stuff like that, pests. You know, I work with people in a lot of areas where, um, you know, they have a very, you know, amicable or at least like amicable enough, like flowering season up until maybe like, the end of September, or, you know, maybe sometime in October, they, they end up with a deep freeze and people, uh, they do their harvest based on, you know, I'm not going to lose it rather than based on, you know, at that full maturity. Um, that, you know, that goes for a lot of, a lot of hemp farms in those kinds of areas as well. Um, you know, you just cut it down, you know, when, when you have to, so you don't lose it. So, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know if those people will even still make it to full maturity, but you know, they certainly would come a lot closer before their deep freeze and their their cutoff time. So for things like that, yeah, definitely, I feel like huge implications. Yeah. Um, it, you you sell pretty much everywhere but Oregon. <laughs> that just so far, yeah. So far, Oregon and Idaho. Oh, Idaho. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot going on in Idaho no. anyway, although. No. So the thing about Idaho is like, they're a little weird. Like we use, um, you know, a, a limited spectrum of bacteria, right? Like okay. we've got five strains of, of a beneficial bacillus that are in our products and in all the products or is it just in one of them? It's in two of them. Two, so okay. like it's in like the veg and the, the flower base cool. products. Uh, so you are feeding the, the microbes at all times. Um, but for some reason in Idaho, they require that beneficial bacteria uh, be registered with the EPA as a pesticide. You know, obviously we disagree with that. Yeah. I agree that, you know, beneficials are helpful against pests per se. Um, but nobody's going to call any of our products a pesticide. It's just not going to happen. Like if that's your requirement, we're not dealing with your state. No doubt. Um, in Oregon, you know, we're, we've been faithfully chugging away at getting our registrations in Oregon, but anybody who's done business in Oregon knows that that is a multi-year process. It's so, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So like we're pretty much good everywhere else. Um, we want to be in Oregon. I mean, we've already got, you know, stores that are interested in carrying us out there and, you know, grows that that are interested in working with us out there. Um, Absolutely. So we want to get out there as quickly as possible, but it's just, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, shout out to, uh, to Toby over at the department of egg. We love you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I mean, I, <laughs> no, your fault. You're just doing your job. It's just strict over there, man. Hey, it is, you know, but it's, yeah. it's across the board. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. It's OLCC yeah. too. It's not just, um, but if you ever do make it, I'm sure it's going to be a huge market for you. I mean, I do it's know it's going to be a huge market. Yeah, yeah I agree. Mm -hmm. Oregon's fantastic. We want to be out there so bad, and it'll be worth the the hassle and the wait to get out there. Sure, sure. But you know, I mean, on the one hand, like, yeah, it's it's really hard to get through their processes, but at the same time, like, at least the growers in Oregon, I mean, you guys can be super confident that things have been vetted before they're allowed to be used out there. <laughs> You, you, you have to buy direct from you guys or from the stores? No, as far as um, like online ordering, like yeah, drop shipping. Online, yeah, like drop shipping. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've been doing that through the Agron website, okay. which is uh, agron.io. Well, it sounds like you can be in Oregon then. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Anyway. Uh, you know, no, no comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are ways. Uh, we don't, we, you know, we don't want to, we don't want them to get into no, any I understand. trouble I understand. Uh, either. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, we, we thought about going the Amazon route and stuff, but it's just so, 
it's so complicated. Like Amazon, they technically, by their terms of service, like there's no way that we could actually um, match those terms, I don't think. Like whatever it is that you're selling, it, it has to be like registered and the same like in all 50 states. And stuff. Oh, I and see. Like with nutrients, like that's impossible. So, oh, it's also like maybe competing with like a future customer. Like maybe somebody else should put us on the Amazon, you know? Well, so that's the issues I've talked to people that sell on Amazon, whether it's a nutrient company or like a, like a beneficial product or something. A lot of these people that have gotten onto Amazon find that what happens is I don't know what your shelf life is, but when they get other people getting the product and then selling it for them on Amazon, there's a lot of these people are seeing outdated product come out. And so, right. So a lot of nutrients, um, will have like a two year shelf life, which seems to be standard. One year seems to be more standard, but it seems like nutrient lines will push two years. And by the time it gets out to these, whoever these people are distributors on Amazon, it seems like by the time people buy it and stuff, a lot of these things are coming outdated. And so yeah, that, makes sense. that yeah. seems like one of the issues with that. And we do. Yeah. We put like about, um, you know, an 18 to month to 24 mm. month uh, yeah. shelf life on a couple of them. But that's really, that just re- relates to the bacillus. Um, after a couple of years, it'll right. likely start to degrade, but it's also not really integral to the feeding process itself either. Um, you know, and other bacteria can be supplemented anyway. Well, and I've also used, I've used three-year-old bacterial products that work just fine. You know, yeah, you just have to be conservative about, you know, what you tell people. Um, I mean, you know, if you're not letting it freeze and then heating it up to a hundred degrees and then letting it free, I mean, take care of the product, keep it in a stable, you know, environment and it should last. So out there in the nation, even worldwide, are you seeing people use it on farms or are you seeing this more of like a smaller type people using it for smaller grows? Right now, I feel like I feel like we've had more traction uh, in commercial environments. Not to say that it's not great for the home grower, but um, I, I think right now uh, it, it's easier to kind of get something out through commercial channels first than it is to you know to get stuff onto the shelves at stores. Um, you know, that's that's always a challenge. You got to have the the perfect storm of of things kind of going on where, you know, you've got the commercial grows using it and home growers interested in it. You know, that's kind of how you get that, that shelf space over time. So, I mean, to, to me, a, a plant is a plant. I don't care about like what your plant count is. Um, you know, I want you to do as well as possible, no matter what the size of your, your grow is and who knows who's going to be who in a few years, you know? That guy with one yeah. plant could get obsessed and have like a thousand next year, you know? So, um, you know, every single grow is, is just as important. I don't give any less attention to, to a home grower per se, but, um, but the, this system has really seemed to be successfully clicking in for, for commercial environments. Cause it's, it's good and it's clean to run through their irrigation lines. It's, it's easy to mix if they're using dosatrons, like, you know, they can minimize, um, you know, how much mixing it has to do and how many parts they have to get. It's great for uh, storage space. You know what I mean? Like, because you can get it bulk and you don't have to have a bunch of them. So um, storage space is a huge factor. Yeah. Like storage is a huge factor in commercial growth. People don't really think about, but like, <laughs> Like that really does play into stuff and it's like, it's super cost efficient for them. Like they see like a ton of money when they switch over to this and it improves like their performance. I mean, it's really been a great fit for the commercial environment. So, um, you know, I'd say the, the majority of it right now, um, definitely goes out to like to larger farms or commercial productions. Uh, it's just not as like easy to walk into a store and pick it up. Uh, but some, some home growers, you know, I mean, they do, they will go on to the, the Agron site and, and order it and stuff. Um, you know, we've had some conversations of late um, and without getting too specific or bringing up any names or anything. It, it looks like, um, you know, we have some potential for some pretty, uh, to me, impressive uh, distributorship uh, 
possibly coming up here with some people who are, uh, you know, very experienced in kind of helping to get some other brands that are uh, famous out there now kind of onto the retail market. Uh, and I think this year, uh, over the course of this year, that presence is going to begin to pick up significantly. Um, can I ask you, you had mentioned to me that you were working with, I believe, a farm or a grower that was going to enter a contest? You know, there's a, a, a farm out there uh, and a good friend of mine, like he's uh, very involved with them. Um, and uh, this past year, uh, they worked with a, a soil company who we're also friends with. Uh, they're called Bio365 out of California and they are... Um, they're fantastic. Yeah, like they're, they're killing it. Um, so, uh, a friend of mine over there, uh, he, he tried, you know, our nutrients at his own home grow, uh, combined with their products and they were very, very happy with the result. Uh, this past year, they, they, uh, they worked with my friend's farm up in Oregon. Um, and I, I believe they used just the Bio 365 and their micro product basically to grow some flour, um, like as a trial, if you will. And the, the soil company, Bio 365, paid for them to, to go into the Oregon Growers Cup, uh, which they didn't really think too much of. Um, so they submitted the flour. Um, they won you know, within the, the top three positions in, in one of the categories that the Oregon's grows, uh, Oregon Growers Cup for flour, um, which is not an easy thing to do because no. there is a lot of good flour in that contest. Competition. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, uh, you know, those, that farm, you know, that farm, they're good friends of, of ours. Um, and the, the guys from uh, Bio 365, you know, they, recommended that we were uh, a winning combination with their product and uh you know so everything kind of came together full circle there so so yeah we may have a little um project coming up this, nice. this season in oregon where you know last year they just they kind of grew it um and, and it got entered and they kind of you know they placed very well and so this year they're looking at it a little bit differently where we're talking about like well maybe let's like let's really take a go at it this time so, <laughs> well, that's awesome. And, you know, uh, like you said, the competition on that kind of stuff is fierce. Um, so, but bottom line is like you've said, you, you've shown COAs before I've seen them, I've seen a picture of it and, you know, you, it seems like these nutrients are able to push these plants to their, their full potential. Yeah. I mean, we've had, we've had good test results all across the board right. for sure. You right. know, it's, it's one of those things like it can make, a major difference for some growers, some growers, you know, some growers that are like really, really good, you know, and you already know your genetics really, really well. Um, it might not make as impactful of a difference from you because you're already killing it and you're already getting out of your genetics, like pretty much what you can get out of them. But, you know, for them, you know, for a grower like that, there's still always, you know, maybe the plant finished faster or maybe, you know, they saved money on doing that or maybe it was just easier for them to work with. Um, maybe they didn't have to clean their lines as much. I mean, there's still like little advantages for them there. But for some growers who maybe haven't quite gotten to that point yet, for them, it makes like a major impact getting them closer to that like competitive edge with the people who are like, really, really top here, which like, and you kind of talked about that earlier. And that is one of those things that we wanted to address. Like when we were combining those technologies with other things, I mean, there's that, I mean, wanting to, for, for startup home growers to be able to grow, to make it easier for you, like as an individual to grow your own safe, clean medicine, you know, this is like, this is all super like philosophical, like pipe dream, like utopia kind of thinking. But to me, it's like, to me, like legal cannabis should at least eventually all across the board be inclusive to people being able to produce their own in the same yeah. way that everybody 
should be able to have the option of growing their own vegetables. You need to know, I mean, you don't need to know, but you deserve to at least have the option to know what is going into what is going into your body. Yeah. And if you don't care about that, fine, more power to you. But if you do care about that, well then like that's something that, you know, we would like to be able to to help be a part of, you know, make it easier for you to have something clean and high quality, like, you know, dispensary grade or better or whatever. And I think that's important for commercial places that I have seen places I've, I've done farm tours where I'll walk into their nutrient room and they'll have what looks like hundreds of lines, <laughs> 25 boxes with lines going in them, 15 different pipes on the wall and 18 different, you know, uh, uh, uh valves. And it's like, geez, man, I mean, screw that not only does it look expensive, but come on, there's air written all over that. You know what I mean? Oh but, yeah, definitely. And I mean, you know, all the electrical conductivity issues that, you know, you could come up with that you don't know about. Yeah. You know, I mean, even taking right. an AC meter and reading like what the current is, I mean, it doesn't tell you anything about what's going on. So, you know, if you try to mix like too many different things from different lines, like you could just be locking it all out, right. killing the mobility rate and, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you really, really got to know what you're doing to start mixing stuff from like different places. Otherwise you're, you're kind of boxed into like whatever the system, a specific company has designed for you for, you know, for safety sake. I would imagine for the commercial people out there and the people that would want to try your product nationwide, uh, we have a lot of listeners nationwide. Yeah. So you, know, you can definitely find more info on it at tgrowsolutions.com. Uh, you know, we're available to order uh, through Agron, uh, which is www.agron.io. Uh, there is probably some shipping involved with them. Although last time, um, I think their shipping calculator was not necessarily accurate. So if it says something, don't be scared off by that. Just wait to find out what the real number is from them. Um, of course, you know, a, a commercial facility, um, you know, you're welcome to obviously contact us directly. You could, you know, work with us directly as well. Um, we're, we're working on more uh, venues for, for places to be able to order from uh, easily and conveniently. So, you know, I'd expect this year to, uh, to see, to see it out there a lot more, but you know, if there's, any possible interest in, in learning more about it or seeing if it is a fit for your facility or your farm or anything, um, just reach out. You know, we have a phone number on our website. Uh, and if you solutions. call that phone number, yeah, it'll, it'll dial through to my cell phone directly. So, um, you know, it's actually me that you'll be reaching. <laughs> okay. One of the prize areas, you know, like you guys out in Oregon have some of the best, like most talented growers, some of the best land out there, you know. Yeah, uh, microclimate uh, down here is great. Yeah, and I can't wait to be a part of it. And I know, too, like some of the margins in Oregon, I mean, this is probably an understatement where like the growers out there are going to laugh when they hear me say this, but I feel like some of the margins might be a little bit rough on you guys. So, <laughs> like yeah. anything. I feel like anything that we can do to like help, you know, provide like better quality or I mean, even just good quality materials for that matter, like at a price point, um, you know, that's going to add some, a little bit more leverage, like on your ROI, I think is going to have a huge impact on, on people in Oregon, you know, like I really want to get out there for that reason too. Like legit, like, yeah, we're a company we want, you know, the sales, but like through those sales, like I, I legit hope that it's like helping. Well, I mean, and if you work with farms out here, all this stuff's going to see the shelf, you know, and so that's going to carry on. You want clean medicine all the way through. Oh yeah, for sure. And Oregon tests for all that too. Oregon does metals tests and all that stuff too, don't they? Uh, not heavy metals. There's two things not that metals, I'm, okay. yeah, there's two things I'm concerned about. One is heavy metals and the other two is we don't test for mold anymore. Now we test. Yeah, I know. Now here's the deal though. They test. Well, they test for, what is it? Water, not water retention, water, uh, uh moisture content, moisture yeah. content. Thank you. They do test for that, which is supposed to be an indicator for t potential mold. Uh, 
But bottom line, it is. But like, but you can have mold in there with that, like low that's, moisture content. So. That's the thing. Well, you can already already have mold in there that's already in there um, before you just dry. Yeah, yeah. now it's and just now dry. It's like a powder. Yeah, they can spread to everything else. But, right. You know, whatever. Yeah. Well, that's my concern. And for the most part, I think the flower is fairly safe. My concern is that there are extract companies that are running this kind of moldy flower because what happens is they can run it. Then you can't see the mold. Like there's no way to even identify that it has it. And because the state doesn't test for it, they don't have any mold. You know, they can run a whole moldy bud, you know, run it through butane quote unquote, kill all the mold, which is why they claim it's still healthy. They don't address the mycotoxins that are still in there. You can't kill a toxin, right? There is no, no death to a it's toxin. It's not alive. Right. It's not alive to be killed. Right. So, <laughs> so there's definitely concerns there. I, I do on our podcast, I do mention to people, you know, make sure you know your growers, make sure you know your extractors. And there are extractors that are known to do that. So you do have well, to yeah, be I mean, aware like, of that. Like the old like the old cartridge joke, right? Like, yeah, distillate is not made out of good quality, but <laughs> no. <laughs> and they'll say, "Oh, we can take it all out. We can take it all out." There's no evidence that you can remove mycotoxins from anything. Um, and again, you can't kill it either. So, um, no, it's just residue. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's um, like obviously powdery mildew like comes from external factors but the yeah. susceptibility to that is like definitely a systemic problem within plant genetics and that is a hundred percent the most likely plant disease that you will get pm so um you know at, uh, large amounts of um you know carbohydrate reserves inside of the plant like as far as i can tell does seem to uh, help with some of the systemic issues of attracting powdery mildew. But again, like with pets, like we talked about, there's external factors and it's no perfect science. It's not a cure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and actually I believe, I believe that I have a way to um, potentially uh, and safely and cleanly systemically inoculate a plant against botrytis, which actually, um, is a conversation I would have with you if you were working with us, but not you, but like uh, anyone listening. Oh, okay. That was still like in some pretty early stages of experimentation, but so far um, it's going well. <laughs> yeah, there is a way to, to do it. It's been proven. Um, it's been proven in tomato plants. Oh, okay. so, Excellent. So well, just, uh, is that what's new? Some versions. Is that yeah. what's going to come around the corner for? For Joel is uh, some super, super mold proof. Uh, plant. Maybe down the line, actually, the next standalone product will be a, a 19 L amino acid formula. You get... <laughs> Good luck with that name. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to well, call that? Already... Silver uh, Dragon? Probably the, probably the White Knight. White Knight. Okay. I like that. Uh, so we're thinking that maybe, um, you know, the horse from the White Royal might switch over to the amino acids and might have another queen for the White Knight. But, um, I mean, for the White Royal. But um, I don't know. That's what we're the tossing around right now. But, yeah, that's the uh, the next standalone product, product will be a, a 19 L amino acid. Um. Which is new, as far as I'm aware. I don't yeah. think anyone else has put one of those I, out. I haven't heard of anything. You know, I love your I love your uh, packaging too. I when me and Sarah do our mushroom trips, we just stare at your bottles all day, <laughs> make up our own stories. <laughs> you literally could do that. Yeah, like that wouldn't be a bad trip at all. They're no. moderately friendly as long as you don't bring the green dragon in. That <laughs> one might get off. I have sent you down the wrong path. All right, know. right. Bad trip. Bad trip. <laughs> Now, the people that are on IG that want to get a hold of you, a lot of people with, that are involved with cannabis, even commercially, are on IG. Can they reach out to you on IG? Yeah, for sure. So there, there is a, a Kegro Solutions Instagram, um, probably the easier one to remember, okay. although uh, it doesn't quite have the, uh, the following or the uh, interaction that my own does quite yet. We're starting to do a little bit more with it. Obviously, I want to grow it, but... Uh, growing Instagram is hard. It is a uh, different story. Um, so my own personal uh, Instagram is Joel underscore Kegro. 
um, you know, either one, if you reach out to us, uh, you'll be able to, to find me there. Uh, and also on Instagram right now, uh, I should mention, uh, you know, we're also teamed up with uh, Bio365, uh, with Bioharmonic Tonic, and uh, Dynasty Genetics. Uh, you know, and, and he's out of, yeah, and he's out of Portland. Um, so a lot of guys, yeah, so he's probably, you guys are probably pretty well familiar with some of his stuff out there. And, and Bioharmonic yeah. Tonic, they're from the Portland area also. Uh, and they also do the the laughing dog farms right uh, up there. So uh, and Bio three sixty five. I mean, those guys just are just killing it right now. So it's you know it's a really cool uh, team up in my opinion. At least it's you know some of some of my favorite people uh, in this industry. Well, we really appreciate this, Joel, for coming back on. You always really bring a lot of knowledge. You're a smart guy. And, uh, I know for sure that I, I have full confidence in the nutrient line and I want the listeners to know that. So again, we really appreciate you coming on brother. Well, thank you so much for, for having me on man. It's always a great time talking to you. I'm higher peaks and you've just listened to the dirt show. If you like this episode, please like share comment and go to organrooted.com where you can subscribe to us on your favorite platform like iTunes, Pandora, or Spotify. Also check us out on our YouTube for videos and IG Facebook and Twitter for all our updates. Thank you for listening.